Hello, and welcome to week four of our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing of Harmful Algal Blooms. This week's session is large-scale monitoring using remote sensing and citizen science. My name is Sherry Palacios, and my co-trainer is Amita Mehta, and we are delighted that you are joining us for another week in this series. We are very excited to have our guest speaker, with Wilson Salves, who is with us from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and will be presenting his group's project titled Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or Cyan. He will be presenting about halfway through this session. Just a few reminders on the course structure. We have been meeting on Tuesdays for the last several weeks and have covered an overview of HADS, sensors, coupled remote sensing and biogeophysical model approaches to forecasting, and this week, large-scale monitoring. We have covered both marine and inland water HADS. A question and answer period will follow today's presentation. Please use the chat feature of the webinar software to write and submit your questions, and you can do that anytime during this presentation. My email will be provided in this chat window if you'd like to email questions to me. While this is the last week of broadcast for the webinar series, it is not going away. You can access all the course materials on the RSET website. There, you'll find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and the PDF of each homework assignment and a link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of our metrics. Once you register, you automatically will be taken to view the recording. The links for the two homework assignments are available now online and must be submitted through Google Forms. To receive credit for homework, you must submit the answers to the homework by the deadline. The deadline for homework one is October 1st, and the deadline for homework two, which is available today, it's October 15th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete both homework assignments by the due date. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. So why have you taken this course? We recognize that some of you come from a harmful algal bloom background and wanted to learn more about how remote sensing can be used as a tool for monitoring. Some of you came from a remote sensing background and wanted to learn more about HABs. We hope that we have met your course objective by providing an overview of satellite Earth observation resources, data, and tools available for HAB applications. We hope by the end of today's session, you are able to identify NASA's Earth Science Remote Sensing Data products for the identification and monitoring HABs. To describe how coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches are used in decision support tools, and to use some NASA Earth Science data tools to monitor for HABs. This week, we will talk about large-scale monitoring, and most of our focus will be on freshwater systems. I really like this image on the right. It shows a cyanobacteria bloom in Western Lake Erie, which is a part of the Great Lakes in North America. The reason why I like it, and you kind of have to look closely across the whole scene, is because it illustrates how horizontally patchy blooms can be. Notice also the lines running across the bloom. These are ship tracks, and they show how blooms can be surface aggregations of cells that when disturbed, reveal the water below is not as dense of a bloom. This helps to demonstrate how these blooms can have three-dimensional structure that may not be visible from remote sensing imagery reminding us that geophysical models are needed to understand how circulation patterns can concentrate and dilute blooms over a particular region. This week, we will briefly review prior weeks. There will be an overview of cyanobacterial HABs or cyanohabs. I will review some case studies of freshwater cyanohab monitoring tools. I'll provide some case studies of how citizen science is used in HAB monitoring including some smartphone apps that can aid in citizen science. Then we will hear from our guest speaker, Wilson Salt, who will talk to us about the EPA Cyan Project. After his presentation, I'll briefly summarize the course. 
So let's get started with a short review. In week one, we provided a description for what is a harmful algal bloom. Harmful algal blooms, or HABs, occur when colonies of algae, simple plants that live in the sea and fresh water, grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The human illnesses caused by HABs, though rare, can be debilitating or even fatal. In week two, Dr. Amita Mehta talked about satellites that are useful for HAB monitoring, including Landsat 7 and 8, Terra and Aqua with the MODIS sensor, the Suomi National Polar Partnership's VIRS sensor, and the imagers aboard the Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 satellites. Also in week two, Amita provided information to you of data access and processing tools for HAB monitoring. These include links to data portals such as Ocean Color Web, Giovanni, and NOAA's Coast Watch. She also mentioned the image processing software CDAS, which is freely available from NASA's Ocean Biology Processing Group. You can find tutorials on how to use CDAS at the website. Remote sensing provides continuous global coverage with consistent observations compared to limited point measurements from surface or ship-based water sampling. Optical and near-infrared remote sensing observations from Landsat, Terra and Aquamotus, Suomi NPP VIRS, Sentinel-2 Multispectral Imager, and Sentinel-3 Ocean and Land Color Instrument are used operationally for qualitative and quantitative HAB monitoring, which includes chlorophyll and sea surface temperature observations. Remote sensing is a tool to aid in monitoring and forecast of HAB events for decision support. It's not meant to replace ground measurements. In week three, we reviewed NOAA's HAB operational forecast system for Karenia brevis blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. This forecast system combines ocean satellite imagery, field observations, fluid dynamics models, public health reports, and ocean buoy data. It is not only a forecast tool, but a platform for communicating HAB events to stakeholders. After reviewing this operational system, we heard from Dr. Clarissa Anderson about her forecasting system named CHARM for Pseudonychia blooms along the U.S. West Coast. So where does that put us today? Today we are talking about cyanobacterial HABs, some of the organisms implicated in them, impacts to human health, past noteworthy events, and an algorithm that is effectively used to identify cyanohabs. We will also review two case studies of cyanohab forecasting systems, large-scale citizen science efforts used to monitor for cyanohabs, and a few smartphone apps that can aid in cyanohab monitoring. In any match, it is helpful to know one's opponent. And in this case, it's the cyanobacterial groups that are implicated in toxic events that imperil freshwater systems. These negatively affect freshwater ecosystems and drinking water systems. On this slide are microscope images of seven common cyanobacterial groups that cause cyanohabs. Conditions range from skin irritation to liver impairment from liver toxins, also known as hepatotoxins, to impairment of the nervous system by neurotoxins. Some hepatotoxins, like microcystin, can kill you in two ways. Under high dosage, one can die from acute liver failure. Under low-level chronic exposure, the toxin promotes liver tumors or cancer. These impacts can result from external exposure like direct contact with skin while swimming or handling bloom water. Impacts can occur from ingestion of water by drinking it, or in fish or shellfish that contain the toxin that somebody eats, or in some types of vegetable produce that have been irrigated with toxic water. Impacts can also occur from breathing the toxins. Airborne toxic events are less well known with cyanohabs, but are an active area of research. Under a microscope, you can see that the cell morphology of these groups spans a diverse array of shapes and sizes. 
This is important because while the pigments phycocyanin or phycourethrin that's contained in um, these organisms may be one way to discriminate the cyanobacteria from other phytoplankton, it is the morphology of the cells and how that affects the optical properties of the bloom that may aid in distinguishing cyanobacterial groups from each other. To the naked eye, it's challenging to distinguish these groups from each other. Because to our eye, these blooms look like green scum, like you see in these images here. On the left is a well-known cyanohab researcher named Dr. Hans Pearl, collecting a surface sample from Lake Taihu, China. Lake Taihu has encountered widespread microcystis blooms for some time. On the right is an image of a water sample collected from a lake near me named Pinto Lake. It is also primarily a microcystis bloom. We have these blooms seasonally in Pinto Lake, and we are actively working on remote sensing methods to better identify blooms to help in adaptive management decisions at Pinto Lake, but also in other drinking water reservoirs throughout the state and in the region. The ability to identify and forecast these cyanohab events is important for protecting human health, as the toxins in these tabs can get into our drinking water system and exposure can be life-threatening. Imagine waking up one morning and being told not to drink the water. Nearly 500,000 residents served by the water system of Toledo, Ohio, were asked to turn off their water faucets because a toxic cyanobacterial bloom had shut down their municipal water supply. They could not use the water for drinking, eating, bathing, or even for their pets or livestock. Toledo, Ohio rests along the shores of Western Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes of North America. This water crisis that I'm describing here, and you see pictures of, occurred in early August 2014 and lasted for about two days. The crisis caused people to seek clean drinking water from emergency supplies provided by local, state, and federal government emergency services. This water crisis was years in the making, and this event precipitated investment into monitoring the lake and understanding ways to mitigate these blooms. This problem is not just isolated to Lake Erie, but is present in other freshwater systems. And this problem has not gone away in Lake Erie, where blooms continue to be a threat to recreational activities and drinking water supplies. Human health crises caused by, caused by cyanohabs are a global problem. As mentioned earlier, cyanohabs are an ongoing problem in China's Lake Taihu which you can see in the upper left panel of this image here. Cyanohabs are an area of active research also in Southern Africa, as with the Cyano Lakes Project, where they are using remote sensing of South African lakes and reservoirs to monitor for cyanohabs using the Sentinel series um, satellites. Cyanohabs can also be found in the brackish waters of the Baltic Sea, which you see on the lower right, <clears throat> where there's been a strong correlation over several years, over actually a couple of decades, um, that's described a correlation between rising temperatures and the incidence of these HAB events. So this problem is a global problem, and we, re we use remote sensing observations to help in monitoring them. There are a variety of remote sensing algorithms used for optically discriminating cyanobacteria from the remote sensing signal. We've already talked about the first three in this list. They include chlorophyll A concentration, chlorophyll A anomaly, and algorithms specifically targeting the pigment phycocyanin, which is in cyanobacteria, but not in most other phytoplankton groups. The other algorithm that we're talking about today is the cyanobacteria index, or CI. There are more algorithms than those listed here, but these are the ones more widely adopted for operational forecasting systems. Of these, the cyanobacteria index is used by NOAA for the identification and forecasting of cyanohabs in Lake Erie and other Great Lakes. You can see the equation here. The CI is defined as the negative of the spectral shape of normalized water leaving radiance at 681 nanometers. Normalized water leaving radiance is one of the L2 data products that you can get from processing 
imagery. In this case, the CI description that I'm giving you here is for the Maris bands. The spectral shape at 681 nanometers in the second equation is defined here. Please note, again, that these wavelengths are for the former Maris sensor. The CI has been adapted for MODIS and is now currently used for the OLCI sensor on the Sentinel-3. Who uses the CI for monitoring cyanohabs? Several groups do, and here we will focus on two case studies, one of which is operational and has been rigorously tested, and the other which is still in the experimental phase of development. Last week, we talked about the NOAA HAB operational forecast system and its HAB bulletin for the Gulf of Mexico and the monitoring of the toxic dinoflagellate Corinia brevis. This week, we will focus on another one of their products that focuses on the blooms of the toxic cyanobacterium <clears throat> Microcystis aeruginosa in Lake Erie. Along the shoreline of the lake are drinking water intakes for municipal water suppliers for various cities, including Toledo, Ohio. You're now familiar with the water crisis of 2014 that happened there. This is not a new problem in Lake Erie, and for some time, researchers have been working on an operational forecasting system for cyanohabs to aid in decision support. This forecasting system uses satellite imagery from the MODIS sensor on Terra or Aqua, or the OLCI sensor on Sentinel-3. It uses field observations, observed and modeled fluid dynamics of the lake, predictive models for mixing and scum formation, and buoy data. These are all used to predict bloom location, three-day forca three forecasts of transport, mixing, scum formation, and bloom decline. The forecasts are helpful for water resource managers and recreational users of the lake. Basically, they have an idea where the bloom will be in three days' time. A person can subscribe to the HAB Bulletin. These forecasts usually start in July and end in October, depending on the HAB conditions that year. These bulletins are emailed to users twice per week during a bloom. I encourage you to follow the links at the bottom of the slide if you'd like a more in-depth description of the bulletin. So what might you see in the bulletin? The image here is from August 30th of this year and shows the cyanobacteria index computed from a Sentinel-3 image. Gray indicates clouds and black indicates area where, areas where cyanobacteria were not detected. This CI image is the seed image for predicting the biology component of the forecasting model. As you can see here, the bloom is concentrated in the, upper, in the western part of the basin where these blooms typically originate. The initial seed image from August 30th is combined with surface currents from the Great Lakes Operational Forecast System and the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment Particle Trajectory Model to create a now cast of bloom movement from the date of the satellite image acquisition, in this case, August 30th, to the date of the bulletin, in this case, August 31st. So that is why this image looks slightly different from the previous one. It's a one-day step into the future as computed from the satellite model inputs. Based on wind data from the Great Lakes Operational Forecast System, a 72-hour forecast of surface currents is created, and that's what you see here in this image. It is this surface current prediction, along with a now cast image, and forecasts of mixing, scum formation, and temperature-dependent bloom decline that are used to create this image, which is the cyanobacteria index forecast 72 hours into the future. This image can be used to inform research, resource managers about the location and timing of landfall of these cyanobacteria blooms. There's more information provided in the bulletin publication that I'm showing you here. And again, I encourage you to read the guide to the Lake Erie HAD Bulletin. The link to that guide is the second one at the bottom of this slide. To recap, this bulletin provides a 72-hour forecast of cyanobacteria bloom location in Lake Erie by incorporating satellite imagery, fluid dynamics observations and model output, mixing models, and a biological decay model based on temperature. 
It's a valuable tool for drinking water resource managers. This HAB bulletin has been rigorously tested and is operational. An experimental model for the same region is the HAB tracker developed by NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory and the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research. It too is a forecasting system and it provides a five-day forecast in animation form for the location and intensity of cyanobacterial blooms in Lake Erie. It updates daily with the latest weather forecast and modeled currents <clears throat> along with the latest clear image of the lake. The forecast, excuse me, the forecast includes a three-dimensional component to the water motion that allows a nuanced forecast of bloom location, both at the surface and within the water column. In this slide, you only see the static image from the HAB tracker. I encourage you to visit their website and check out the animation in the forecast. Links to the website and more information about the HAB tracker are located at the bottom of this slide. Again, this is an experimental product that is making its way through a rigorous testing to one day become an operational product. As we touched on last week, validation of these models is important towards making them operational. A part of validation is the collection of in situ observations by research teams. On the ground observations by citizen science teams are also helpful for confirming the presence of blooms, <clears throat> the extent of blooms, and the phytoplankton species present. While these citizen science observations may or may not be able to be used for model validation, they are an important component to monitoring. Their prevalence and use is growing too, which is kind of exciting to see all these creative ideas in citizen science. In this next section, I will highlight a few citizen science efforts aimed at HAB monitoring. We'll review four of these projects. They are the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative, a project of general aviation pilots collecting imagery, and the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or CYAN. These citizen science programs are located within the U.S., and the audience in the U.S. might find these useful. Even so, for all of our participants, because we know of a large international audience, we hope you'll gain some ideas about how these programs are designed and implemented so it may help you in your regional efforts at designing a citizen science program if that is a direction you would like to take. First up is the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, or PMN. The PMN was formed in 2001 in the state of South Carolina in the U.S. as a part of NOAA's Marine Biotoxins Program. It was established to monitor marine phytoplankton and HABs. Some of the stated goals of the project include monitor and maintain an extended survey area along coastal waters throughout the year, create a comprehensive list of harmful algal species inhabiting coastal marine waters, identify general trends where harmful algal blooms are more likely to occur, isolate areas prone to HABs for further study by marine biotoxins researchers in an effort to assist state managers in mitigating the effects of HABs, and promote an increased awareness and education to the public on HABs. NOAA trains PMN volunteers, and the time it has existed, volunteers have identified over 250 algal blooms, of which 15 were toxic events. The species composition data these volunteers collect help researchers target particular areas for further monitoring efforts. This citizen science project uses a smartphone app named Phyto to teach volunteers how to identify some phytoplankton species of interest commonly found in the target areas. You can see the link to Phyto in this screenshot of the PMN website. If you do go to this website, you see that big explore data button. And if you click on that button, this page will eventually show up. This is the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network data viewer. There, members of the public can access their freely available data sets by navigating to the PMN database. And you can see it's focused in primarily on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast states of the US, but it is a useful piece of information to use if you are thinking of designing something like this for your region. 
Another citizen science program is named the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. This is actually three coordinated monitoring projects to locate and understand where cyanobacteria blooms are occurring and how they may be changing. One is called Bloom Watch, and you can see a listing of these three across the top of this screenshot. Bloom, Bloom Watch is listed here. It is a smartphone app that you can download and use. It teaches you what to look for when you visit a lake or a river, and when you think you see a cyanobacteria bloom, you collect imagery of the bloom or the surface of the water using the smartphone and then submit it to the, through the app to be sent to the proper agency. The next citizen science project in the collaborative is Cyanoscope, and it too uses a smartphone. This one is a little bit more involved in that the volunteer needs to obtain a kit containing a net tow, slide making materials, an elementary microscope with an attachment to collect microscope images from the smartphone. With this project, the volunteer collects a water sample with the net tow, prepares a slide for the microscope, captures an image of the sample, and then submits the image to the cyanoscope database via the web. The third project is called Cyano Monitoring. This project is intended to collect water samples to measure water temperature, chlorophyll, and phycocyanin concentration over time to determine trends in blooms. This is to understand how a particular water body may be changing, to compare water bodies, and to understand if climate change may be having an impact on cyanobacterial blooms. The volunteer uses a water sampler to collect temperature and fluorometry and then returns the information via the web. There is a wealth of information on the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative website, and I encourage you to check it out. A new program that's just in its early stages of development is a citizen science project that uses general aviation pilots. In the US, we sometimes refer to these um, folks as private pilots. These are people who have volunteered to attach a video camera to the underside of their single engine airplanes and to collect and return video imagery of the regions where they fly. For now, this project is primarily focused on the Lake Erie region. The idea is that these pilots who fly somewhat regularly as a hobby could provide an early warning of the cyanohabs that form in this environment. Here is an example of a series of images collected from roughly the same area over a period of a few weeks, and it's just going to continue to loop. You will see that these are not georeferenced images, if you're familiar with working with remote sensing imagery. Um, they are collected at different angles and on different days, and an, are an unlikely to be considered science quality. But the value they add is that they are collected regularly and may be useful to resource managers for the need to sample a particular region. So if you look at the series of images here, you can see at one point it doesn't look like there's a bloom, and then as the month progresses, you increasingly see a bloom. So while this is not science quality data, it could inform managers to send out a team to sample. We have already talked about a few smartphone apps. In the Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, we talked about the Phyto app. This app is available, but it is in need of an update, of an update, and it's on schedule to be updated soon. Another app that we talked about was with the Cyanobacterial Monitoring Collaborative, and they use the BloomWatch app, which we talked about just a moment ago. For these two apps um, related to the citizen, specific citizen science projects, we recommend that you navigate through the Citizen Science Project website um, to get more information about those apps. Here, we're going to talk about one app that I find useful, and that is the HydroColor app. HydroColor is an app that uses your smartphone camera to create an estimate of remote sensing reflectance, turbidity, suspended particulate matter, and the backscattering coefficient. Just as the satellite captures the light emitted from the water's surface, your smartphone camera does too. In the case of your smartphone, it collects light at three wavelengths, what we typically refer to as RGB for red, green, and blue. HydroColor prompts the user to capture an image of a gray card, the, like the type you would use in photography, as a means to calibrate, then an image of the sky, and then an image of the water, as you see in the images here that's captured from the, the phone. 
The algorithm then uses these images and the spectral response curves of the imager to compute an estimate of remote sensing reflectance. From the remote sensing reflectance, turbidity, suspended particulate matter, and the backscattering coefficient can be computed, as you see in this table of equations here. I've used this app before, and it's really straightforward to use. All it requires is that gray card, which you can find through online retailers, a smartphone, and the app. Uh, I guess a body of water, too. Hydrocolor is a helpful tool to use in the field and could be incorporated into a citizen science program. Note in the table that the uncertainty estimates for the data products are rather high, so it is important to validate with in-water measurements from a calibrated system before using this tool operationally. As you have seen from other citizen science programs, however, sometimes even if the data may not be science quality, it can still be useful for decision support. I encourage you to check out the HydroColor website if you would like to learn more about the algorithm and if this tool would fit into your science, citizen science program. Now, to hear more about large-scale monitoring in citizen science programs, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Mr. Wilson Sauls. Wilson works with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or Cyan, project. Today, he'll describe the project to us. Thank you, Wilson. I'll hand it off to you now. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Wilson Sauls. I'm an Oak Ridge Science Research Fellow at the EPA in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Um, I have a master's in soils and biogeochemistry and a bachelor's in geology or earth science. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that we're working on called the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or Cyan for short. Um, it's a collaboration between the EPA and three other federal agencies, NASA, NOAA, and USGS. So the or overarching goal of our project is to expand the usage of satellite remote sensing to detect harmful algal blooms, which I'll be calling HABs, H-A-B-S, um, in U.S. lakes. And so why is this important? Uh, I think most of you are probably aware, but HABs pose risks not just to the environment, but also to human health and also to animal health. Um, effects can include nausea, other digestive issues, skin irritation, respiratory issues, liver damage, and very rarely death, um, but, but more commonly in animals, livestock, fish, um, and even pets. So it's a pretty big deal, um, and we definitely want to get a handle on this. Um, so, and, and so what, how, how are we exposed, or how are animals exposed? Um, well, for us, definitely recreational use, swimming, um, boating, jet skiing, um, even just drinking water that has been, even if it's been treated by a municipal treatment center, it could be contaminated still by um, microcystin, which is one of the toxins that we find in harmful algal blooms. Um, shellfish can be contaminated if they're living in the water that's, con that's uh, experiencing a bloom. And even produce that's been irrigated uh, with contaminated water can be, uh, can be toxic. So a lot of different ways to be exposed. Um, so for us, uh, our mission statement is written here, and it's to support the environmental management and public use of the U.S. lakes and estuaries by providing a capability of detecting and quantifying algal blooms and related water quality using satellite data records. Um, so we hope to achieve this by creating a standard and uniform approach to identify HABs, um, to get this information out to the public and to managers who might be able to use it, um, and also to understand how health, economic, and environmental conditions relate to HABs. So these are kind of our overarching goals of the project. Um, so and all of our work mainly revolves around generating um, and, and then secondarily using data products from satellite imagery to provide information on HABs. And when I say products, I'm talking about rasters, um, usually geotiffs, um, that have been calculated by running algorithms across the imagery, the raw imagery, to represent things like cyanobacteria and chlorophyll A concentrations. And most of you may know, but chlorophyll A is a proxy for aquatic algae. Um, so that's a good way to detect when we, when we have a HAB happening. Um, we're also looking at um, temperature, secchi depth, and turbidity, some secondary sort of metrics that we can use to um, to understand these HABs a little bit better. Um, so here, here's a list of our work products that we're doing with this project. Um, 
we have, uh, first off, we want to compile field validation data so we can um, assess how successful the algorithms we're developing are. And even just developing those algorithms requires um, training data. So we use um, in situ water quality data, mostly chlorophyll A or cyanobacteria cell count, um, and we have to compile that. That's the first step. Um, next, we develop the algorithms. And we're using two different satellite platforms mainly. Um, that is Landsat 8 and also um, Maris, which has actually been discontinued. So we, we're switching over to Sentinel-3, uh, which has the OLCI or OLCI sensor aboard. Um, so these are the satellites we're using um, to develop these algorithms and um, or developing those algorithms for those satellites. Um, so next, once we've developed those algorithms, we're going to be evaluating how well they perform using the validation data. And that's kind of an iterative process of, of going back and forth between those two steps until um, we're pleased with the way it's performing based on the, the validation results. Um, and then once we have this data, we want to be applying it um, to, for example, looking at which landscape factors, um, such as slope or um, percentage of agriculture in a watershed, or um, other sort of geographic variables like that, temperature, uh, precipitation, um, which of these are, are the primary drivers of hab occurrence in, in the lakes we're looking at in the US? Also, what are the health effects and the economic impacts of, of HABs um, occurring in these areas? And finally, and this is a big one that we'll talk more about later, um, but data dissemination, getting out the, the, the products that we're generating so that they can be used by the public. Um, so, this is, you know, eventually we want this to be available to the public, um, anyone who wants to go recreate uh, in a water body, for example. Um, but, but for now, the main, the main objective of the project is to get this out to managers, um, mainly state um, and municipal um, entities, and also um, EPA regional offices that might be able to use this, this information. Um, so, for example, you might be closing um, a, a beach, if it's too, if the cyanobacteria concentration is too high, uh, you might be closing off drinking water intakes, um, these kinds of things. So a look at the in situ data. Um, we're getting it, a lot of where we get it is from this website, the Water Quality Portal. Um, it's a public website, anyone can access it, and it's basically a repository for um, all kinds of water quality data. So you can you can go here yourself and download things like um, Secchi depth. You can download um, things like um, macroinvertebrate counts, that kind of stuff. We're using it for chlorophyll A mostly. Um, and again, we're looking a little bit at Secchi depth too. And um, and so, but for chlorophyll A, um, and well, for all data, this is a really great resource, and there's a lot of data here. Um, but it's since it's from so many different organizations, federal, state, local, um, dumping data onto the site, it's uh, in various different formats, and sometimes the quality of the data is uh, not not what we need it to be. So um, just to note, there's about a 30% error in in situ chlorophyll A measurement, up to 30%. So that's pretty high, and if we have erroneous data that's, you know, that's the inherent error in the sampling tools. So if there's also error in the data as it's entered into the database, um, then that's a big problem. So one of our objectives is to really filter out um, the highest quality data so we can be sure that when we're using this data to either train the satellite algorithms or to validate them, um, we're, we're actually doing it reliably and we can, we can count on that data um, as much as possible. And that's a big role that USGS is helping us out with. So looking at um, sort of an example of uh, the spatial and temporal um, extent of this data, this is lake temperature. So we're using um, actually a, a paper that's coming out um, pretty soon here, um, a paper to look at validating Landsat surface temperature, so using Landsat to um, estimate lake temperature. And so this is the in-situ data um, that's available to us. And you see that um, the, the left-hand graphs here are showing um, the distribution of this data throughout time. So generally, across the years, it's gone. We've had a, a good increase of data over the years. This drop-off, we think, might just be due to um, data not being reported yet at the time that this figure was made. But um, generally, there's, there's been an increase. But it does change, and it fluctuates. And who knows what can happen um, with the availability of funds, for example, to um, take these samples. 
Um, but a bigger issue, we think, is uh, down here looking at the months of the year, we have uh, a big spike in the summer, especially in August, and really not much data, in situ data out um, in the winter. So with satellites, um, we can get kind of continuous coverage throughout the year. Um, so this is a really good, a really good um, way to supplement this data. And just to note, we're, we're in no way proposing that um, satellites would would replace in situ sampling. We obviously need the in situ sampling to, to be able to make the satellite um, approach work, but it's a nice, we do think it's a nice complement and that it provides a lot more information um, than just in situ sampling alone. So looking over on the right, we get um, an idea of more of the spatial side. And so the X axis is showing the number of stations per lake and the y-axis is showing the frequency in each of those bins. So you can see the point of this graph is basically that um, most lakes have only a few stations, uh, t 10 or maybe even five or fewer, mostly one. Um, and there are not that many lakes that have a lot of samples in them. Um, with satellite imagery, you have basically as many samples as you have pixels in a lake. So that's a nice improvement. Looking at the bottom graph, we have um, the area, uh, area bins of lakes on the x-axis. And on the y, we have um, the number of lakes. So the bars are showing how many lakes there actually are in the national hydrologic data set. And the triangles are showing what's available with in situ sampling um, in each of these bins. And the circles are showing what's available with Landsat. So you can see there's a lot of lakes um, pretty much in every area category that have, that have data from Landsat. So basically we have, um, you know, again, just a, a big wealth of data that's being added by by satellite information. I think all of you know that if you're in this webinar. <laughs> um, and so spatial resolution, same kind of story here, but um, like I mentioned, we're looking at Landsat and then Maris, which is being um, essentially replaced by Olchi. And so Landsat has a 30 meter resolution, Olchi has 300 meter. Um, and we want to get a three by three pixel window um, at least that big. So if a lake has fewer than three by three pixels, that um, it, it is covering it, then we don't want to use that lake. And the reason for that is the center pixel here we know is reliable. We want to get a center pixel um, that we're certain has no mixing of land signal on the outside. Um, these pixels move across different images. Um, you know, that's, that's not ideal, obviously, but they, they can do that. So um, if it's, you know, if this pixel or this pixel bounces over here a little bit, we might be getting a land signature. So we, we don't use these outer pixels. We just use the inside ones. Um, so this is the minimum size of a lake that we could see with Landsat and the minimum size we could see with Olchi or Maris. And when we look at the U.S., this is the distribution of lakes um, across the entire country, of, of CONUS at least. And we have about 170,000 of 276,000 total lakes that we can see with Landsat. So that's pretty good. Um, Maris and Olchi, obviously it's fewer, close to 2,000, but that's still a lot of lakes. Um, and these are some of the big high impact lakes that uh, are used for drinking water. So um, still a really good resource. Another thing to note is that Landsat is, Landsat 8 is every 16 days and Maris, Olchi, um, pretty much every day. So this is a really good temporal resolution here, which we're gonna talk about next. So these maps are showing lakes um, blown up and color coded. So the lakes are obviously not this big, but they're just blown up so you can see them here. And um, they're color coded by, um, you know, redder is, is more images um, per year. And these are cloud free images per year with Landsat and with Maris and Sentinel 3 LG. Um, so you see with Landsat, we're getting somewhere generally between about at least 10 and up to maybe 30 images. And we have these red stripes where we have overlap um, between these um, image paths here. And the Great Lakes and other large lakes are showing up as zero because they don't actually get a single path covering them. They're too big, but they still obviously have, have data in them as well. Um, and over here, um, we have as many as almost every day of the year with, uh, with the Sentinel-3. So that's really good. Um, we have a really high temporal resolution here. So let's talk a little bit about um, how well these algorithms are performing. Because um, obviously, if they're, if they're not performing well, they, they don't really help us. Um, but luckily they are, uh, for, for Maris at least, um, we have some pretty good validation data here. So we have in-situ chlorophyll A on the X and um, the, the Maris calculated chlorophyll A and the Y. And um, you know, it looks like this data is pretty clustered, but we have pretty good numbers here. Um, root mean square error, mean absolute error, 
and bias, these are the same units as the chlorophyll A. So as a percentage of this range, these are pretty good numbers. Um, and this is just in Florida. Down here we have Florida and also Ohio and New England. And um, again, we have a pretty good mean absolute percent error here, um, which is, uh, if, if you recall back to the in situ error, it's about 30%, up to 30%. So this is kind of within that same range. And in terms of uh, ocean color and, and water quality remote sensing, um, it's, a, it's a pretty good value. So we're pretty happy with this. However, the, um, the Landsat algorithm, uh, we're still working on that. That isn't quite um, here yet, but we, um, we're optimistic that we're going to get um, something hopefully close to this. And um, we're also looking at Sentinel-2, which is the European Space Agency's sort of equivalent to Landsat. Um, and they, but they have some extra bands in the red and red edge range that we can use. And we think that these are actually going to be better for chlorophyll A um, detection. So we're also looking at Sentinel-2 as an option as well. So um, looking a little bit at how we can apply this data, um, this is the spatial trends and spatial extent um, of cyanohab occurrence. And so the top, the top plot is showing us um, Florida, Ohio, and California. And the zigzagging lines are uh, basically you know, the, the data that we have. Um, and so each of these is, is probably one point. Um, and then these lines are showing a trend that we fit through the data here. And this is, uh, the top one is showing us bloom area across uh, 2008 and 20, through 2012. And the bottom one is showing us uh, the percentage of bloom area of the resolvable pixels that are available in these areas. Um, so let's look at this one. This one we think a little more meaningful, um, the percentage of bloom area that, that does um, occur in, in the resolvable area. And um, we see that Florida and Ohio are both, both appear to be increasing. And actually, Ohio has a higher percentage of lakes that, or pixels in lakes that have uh, blooms, it appears here. Um, but California might even have a small decrease um, in, in the spatial extent. And we can kind of look over here at this, um, this Y value here. And so we have no detect, and then whether well, there's a bloom at all, um, and then the bloom is split into low, moderate, and high. Uh, based on the World Health Organization threshold um, for, for these categories um, for cyanobacteria. And uh, the, lower, the lower this number, so this number is kind of telling us how many years does it take for us to see a trend in the data. So the lower this number, uh, the more of a trend there is. And um, we can see that in Florida, um, the no detect is um, decreasing, actually. Um, in only about three years, we see a pretty good trend there and an increase in bloom area in only four years. So these are both meaningful numbers. Um, these numbers, low and moderate, not quite as much, but high, it only takes two years to see um, an increase in high. So we, we do think that there has been an increase in spatial extent um, of, of HABs in Florida. Ohio, uh, a little bit less certain. There's nothing that really pops out there as being a super low number. Um, but California, we have uh, an increase in no detect. Um, with a pretty meaningful number here. Um, and that's so suggesting that there's, there's been um, less area affected by blooms over time, over the study period. But this is, just keep in mind, this is a four-year study period. So um, we're not, it's not completely certain that this is the case, but um, just what we've seen in the study period is, is that um, this, this appears to be what's happening. So uh, looking now at the frequency of, of um, occurrence of cyanohads, and um, this figure on the right is, or sorry, on the left is showing us the percentage of, of time, um, the number of images per total number of images that um, we see blooms that are above the World Health Organization high threshold, which I believe is 100,000 uh, cells per milliliter. And so you can see um, Lake Apopka here in central Florida near Orlando is uh, bright yellow. It's almost all the time, all the images we have um, has a bloom. And the other lakes, a little bit less so, but there are certainly some spots that are, um, that are popping out still. And even this is um, um, Lake Okeechobee. And the outside, you can see, does have um, some somewhat frequent bloom um, area in that, around this area, too. So um, this, is, this is just another way to look at the data that we have. And we can look over here at this right-hand um, figure. It's kind of showing us different ways to look at this data relative to water intakes. 
So the first example would be here. Um, we have what we call adjacent is when there's a water intake that's directly in this three by three window. Um, so we, we're pretty confident, you know, when we have this, if we can't quite get that, we might do this other approach called proximate, which is um, a window that's closest to an intake um, in this case here. And if we can't get that, or just if we want to know about the whole water body, we can look at the whole water body, or we can even look at the whole watershed. So those are just different ways to kind of slice this data um, and, and look at what's happening. Um, so kind of following up on that, this is maybe a little complicated, but um, I think we can get there. So these, these are all dots, and the gray dots each on the top one um, represent a, one of the three by three windows I was just talking about in adjacent ranking. Um, so the black ones um, represent a drinking water intake um, that is, well, a three by three window that contains a drinking water intake. So looking at um, this, this is the, the top quartile here, um, you can see that there are a few of these that fall out kind of at the top. And this is, again, the percentage of pixels that exceed the who high threshold um, and just, just ordered um, and ranked this way. So all this area here, you might say this is high priority area. Um, and it contains a few drinking water intakes, so that's definitely a cause for concern in, in those areas. Um, and down here, just another way to look at it, is with the water body ranking that I was mentioning. And so this is, in this case, each of the gray dots recommend, uh, represents a, um, a lake, a single water body, and each of the black dots rec uh, represents a um, water body that contains a drinking water intake. So it's a little bit, uh, the results are a little bit different, but we can still see, you know, kind of another way of looking at and identifying um, the highest priority lakes. And this is similar to um, the earlier map that I showed of frequency in Florida, but for the whole country. So um, looking at the frequency of time, the percentage of time that the, of the images we have that the cyanobacteria concentration exceeds the who high threshold. And it's just interesting to see. We see a few hot spots around the country, certainly um, in Florida and in kind of the, the south and lower Midwest. Um, so just a, just a neat figure, um, preliminary data, but still neat to look at. So now I uh, just want to talk a little bit about some of the tools that, um, that we use and, and that are also available to you um, if you want to um, do similar work. And so the first is uh, CDAS, which is um, open source, publicly available um, platform created by NASA. And it's kind of similar, for those of you who don't know it, it's, it's kind of similar to ArcGIS a little bit, um, but it's more intended for remote sensing and there's a lot of image processing capability. Um, it's, it's a really neat, really neat piece of software. Um, and eventually we're gonna be having, um, NASA's gonna be making the, um, the cyanobacteria index data that I've been talking about from Ulchi available um, here. And, and then also being able to um, do your own processing on that on that um, imagery. So you can create, you can either use the products that, that NASA and that we have created, or um, you, can, you can do your own products that are tailored to your own needs. Um, so this is a neat open source software that's available um, at this URL if you want to get it. And over here is another one that um, has some overlapping capability, but basically is a plugin for ArcGIS. It's called RS Tools. It's developed by NOAA. And it basically allows you to query, um, query these geotiffs that we're creating um, for uh, different you know, cyanobacteria metrics that you're interested in. So if you want to get this, uh, if you're an ArcGIS user and you want to stick with that, then you can contact Shelly at this email address here. And she should be able to hook you up. So finally, I um, want to talk about kind of the ways that we're going to disseminate this data. And I think this is probably of of big interest for some of you. Um, and so this is the Cyan EPA mobile application, mobile app. And um, this is something we've been working on tirelessly for uh, the last couple of years. And I'm not directly working on this, but I know that um, I've heard a lot of moaning from, uh, from the folks who have been that it's, you know, it's an arduous task. Developing an app is, is not a small thing. Um, but we're really, really happy this is showing a lot of promise. Um, Right now we're kind of in the beta testing mode and um, I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But basically the, uh, the, the goal of this, of this app is for us to allow people who may not have the expertise or the time to, um, 
to process the imagery and, and maybe download the images and, and do all these things um, to access the data in an easy um, on-demand way. So this is, again is for managers who want to who are interested in um, things like beach closures or closures or drinking water intake, um, you know more immediate uh, impact sort of things, or even um, managers who are interested in uh, long-term mitigation of, of um, HAB occurrence. If, if you want to look at how we can uh, reduce HABs or where, mainly where we need to reduce HABs, um, the high priority areas, this app can kind of give you an idea of that. So um, on the left, this is kind of the, just the splash screen where we see um, you can drop pins in various locations of interest and um, these will show you kind of, you know, what the cyanobacteria concentration is, the cell count, um, for the most recent imagery. And they're color coded by these thresholds, which you can actually set yourself. You can change them by default. They're, looks like they're set to the who thresholds, but um, you can change that so you can come with your own color coding scheme. Um, and then here's a screen that basically just shows um, another way of looking at those pins um, with a few more metrics like uh, the trend and uh, the, last, the last week, um, how it's changed across the last week. Here um, on the left is another way of looking at the data. Um, so you can also have a, a nice Google images uh, backdrop. Um, and you know, for, for this given pin right here in Florida, uh, we can look at all the images that are available. And um, then you can click on one and you get to kind of get a nice zoomed in view of it. And you can download it to zoom in further or um, you know, use it for a presentation or um, do whatever you please with that. And over here, we can kind of get uh, a taste of, of what's happening over time at your different locations with this trend analysis tool, which kind of makes a nice, a nice plot that you can um, see how your different points are uh, kind of performing over time. So for now, this is basically, we've been beta testing this, like I said, um, with some state environmental departments and some regional EPA offices. Um, we're going to be doing that kind of moving forward for the um, for foreseeable future of the project and um, and eventually we want to make this um, we're hoping to make it public but we will definitely um, be putting the, the code for this on github so it will be publicly accessible um, and you know we're just really optimistic we think this is already um, making an impact because uh, until recently we were, we were using Maris um, archived Maris data which is um, you know it's not current but it's just a, a way for the managers to kind of see the app, understand how it works, and give us any feedback on it. Um, but in the last couple of weeks, we finally started pushing uh, live Ulchi data. So um, this, is, this is really exciting for us. Um, we think that, again, that like this season, it's going to be making a difference. It's going to be allowing managers to, um, to, to use this data and identify, uh, identify blooms. And, um, and then, of course, moving forward, that will be more and more the case over time. And so um, if you're interested in in using this app and you're from a state or a federal agency, um, then please drop me a line. I have my email address at the end of this presentation, so I'd love to hear from you. And finally, um, this is just kind of another way that we're hoping to disseminate this data or that we're going to disseminate this data. Um, and this is with the EPA's Enviro Atlas. Um, this is a web hosted mapping application that has all kinds of data, um, mostly kind of environmental and demographic data um, invasive species, biodiversity data, uh, pollution data, all kinds of stuff. Um, but we'll be putting our um, cyanobacteria data up here as well. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And that should be happening later this year uh, for Florida, Ohio, and California. Um, and then in about a year from now, we'll be putting up the rest of uh, the continental US, the rest of CONUS will be up here. Um, not exactly sure when, but roughly hoping, hoping for about a year. Um, and this is publicly available, so anyone um, can go on here once it's up. So uh, keep your eyes peeled, and um, we're excited for this to come out, too. So with that, um, I want to thank you for listening and give you um, the URL for our website and my email address. I'd love to hear from you if you have questions, comments, or um, just want to get in touch. And I'll just say for those of you who are not in the U.S., um, we think that this, the approach that we've taken is replicable pretty much anywhere um, around the globe because these satellites, Landsat and Olchi, um, do have global coverage. So we think that if you have your own um, in-situ 
chlorophyll A data or cyanobacteria data um, to validate with, then um, basically you can you can use the algorithms that that we're using um, in developing, and they'll be they'll be published um, in scientific literature, and the the code that we've been using for um, assessing the frequency and the extent of these blooms will be available um, on GitHub, as will um, the source code for the app itself. So um, it will be possible to, to basically develop your own app um, in, in using some of the resources that we um, have used and, and created um, to, do, to do your own similar approach. And I would just emphasize that I think a big part of this project um, um, attaining what I would say is some pretty great success so far is um, engagement with, with the stakeholders. And um, from the very beginning, um, getting in touch with the people who, who will be benefited, benefited from, um, by this and, and who will be using the data um, and seeing what their needs are, what problems they're facing, and, and, and you know, using that to kind of uh, develop your approach. And then you know, while, you, while, you, while the approach is, being, approach is being developed, kind of um, keeping them in the loop and included on decisions that are being made and then certainly during the testing period, um, both so that you can get their feedback and, and make the tool better and so that they can um, you know, continue to feel like they're part of the process and, and so that they can certainly have a, a kind of a feel of how things are going to look and how they might be able to use it uh, moving forward. So um, think, I definitely think it's a replicable approach and replicable approach and um, and hope that uh, it can work for you too. So with that, uh, thanks and I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you, Wilson, for your presentation on Cyan. Today we have talked about cyanohabs more broadly, shown examples of freshwater cyanohab monitoring tools, talked about examples of how citizen science can be used to aid in hab monitoring, including some smartphone apps to help in monitoring. Finally, we learn more about the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, or Cyan. So to sum up this webinar series, why did you take it? The objective of this course was to provide an overview of satellite Earth observation resources, data, and tools available for harmful algal bloom or HAB applications. We hope that by now you are able to identify NASA's Earth Science Remote Sensing Data products for the identification and monitoring of HABs, to describe how coupled remote sensing and modeling approaches are used in decision support tools, and to use some NASA Earth Science data tools to monitor for HABs. Thank you so much for your participation in the Introduction to Remote Sensing for Harmful Algal Blooms webinar series. In a few moments, we will begin the question and answer period. These question and answer sessions are being captured in a document made available on the course website, and you can return to the document later. Also, as a reminder, recordings for each week session are available on the RSET HABS course website if you wish to return to watch them. And remember, your homework assignments are due on October 1st for homework number one and October 15th for homework number two. All right, so um, on question three, I may again call on Wilson to, to help with this one, is how can we access model, these models or tools? My default, especially because we profile it in this webinar series, is that um, we've talked already in week two, and we've talked a few times, and Wilson mentioned it in his presentation as well, is the use of CDAS. And the CI algorithm is one of the available algorithms for data products using CDAS. Um, the un Fortunate thing is that you need a Mac, Unix, or Linux system to do the processing that you would need to derive this data product if you have a Windows system that um, you would not be able to get through to that level. Um, but it is possible to compute the CI. Another approach that you could take is you could you have the algorithm, you have the equation for it. You could do the math yourself if you have image processing software where you can look at each of the different reflectance bands um, and do that computation yourself. Um, I don't know if Wilson, you want to add anything more in there. Uh, sure. So another option that I that I mentioned in the presentation um, is RS tools. And so if you don't have a Mac or Unix or Linux machine, you can use. But if you do have ArcGIS, which you you do need unfortunately for RS tools. But um, if you do have that on a PC machine, you can use 
um, RS tools to to do that same process. So that, that could be helpful for some people. Great. Have you used the RS tools tool? Um, I I have not personally, okay. uh, unfortunately. But yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty user friendly, and I think they've improved it um, uh, in the last year or so. So it's okay. A little more, a little more yeah, I think. I'll be sending an email to Michelle Tomlinson because I'm really interested in <laughs> being able to see how we could expand this just because different user groups use yeah. different tools. And if people are already using ArcGIS, then this might be a way to expand and using remote sensing more than the capability that exists now. So thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah, I hope she doesn't mind all the email. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably have asked her first before, yeah. before sharing the email. <laughs> yeah, maybe give her a heads up. Yeah, um, good, good idea. Okay, this next one I'm going to need to call an Amita because um, this is not my area of specialty and I really appreciate Amita coming through for us and talking to us a lot more on question four. And I'll read it. And Amita, if you don't mind going um, audible, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we can hear your answer. And the, the question was, you mentioned wind data. Can you please share some global publicly available wind data sources and also their applicability? So uh, can you hear me? Yes, just a little bit louder, please. Okay, yeah, so um, there are two sources that I'm aware of. Uh, the first one is MERA, that's a reanalysis model from NASA. Uh, it, so it's a model in which a lot of satellite data gets assimilated, and uh, that provides uh, surface winds, that's what you were talking about in the presentation. So, and Giovanni tool we talked about in week two for uh, getting MODIS products, so it's the same tool. If you search MERA or if you search WINS, you will get to the link where you can download the wind data. These data are about half degree or 0.5 by 0.6 degree resolution. So it's relatively uh, low resolution. So on inland lakes, um, you have to see how big your reservoir is that you're interested in. Um, but these data are easily available. The second one, uh, is from uh, satellite scatterometer data. These data are produced by NASA JPL, and um, you can go there and find the data, but they're also available from the NOAA site that I mentioned here. This is, um, this is ASCAT, but there's QuickSCAT. There are different satellites carrying scatterometers, and all these data are available through both NASA and NOAA. Uh, so these uh, data have um, resolution varying from about 12.5 kilometers to 50 kilometers, depending on which scatterometer you use. So that's slightly higher resolution than MERA, and these uh, scatterometers are very specifically the data we use to get surface winds. So um, you can use those. I'm not sure how uh, well they resolve uh, inland lakes because they were designed for ocean surface winds. Uh, but I'm like we've seen these on Great Lakes and like bigger reservoirs. You can get this data for sure. All right. Thank you, Amita. No problem. So I'm going to just move to number five. Um, what is the possibility of reusing HAB affected freshwater lake water for drinking and irrigation purposes? Um, and uh, just to let you guys know that my area of specialty is in the remote sensing of these um, blooms. It's less so in the toxins. And Wilson came through and really helped us out here uh, with his team. Um, but the, my understanding is that when the bloom ends, the toxins in the environment will begin to reduce. But it, to be certain, it's important to test the water for toxins before allowing use. And Wilson provided a lot more information for this um, on this link here with the, um, the EPA um, link on groundwater and drinking water, and then some more information on uh, cyanotoxins in drinking water. And there are a whole bunch of different um, links that you can find in there on best practices and advice to management on when it is safe to um, open up the, uh, the lake for or water source for um, drinking water purposes. Um, so I would advise you guys to go to that link to get um, more accurate information um, than, uh, than just the remote sensing information. Um, I did want to skip down because we have Wilson with us here um, on to question 10. 
Um, because Wilson is now, uh, has become quite expert at looking at small inland bodies of water, uh, that this person was happy to see that uh, Florida was profiled, and that one area that um, they're interested in is the Indian River Lagoon, Lagoon Estuary. And um, it's 150 miles long, but it's not very wide. Um, what would be the, um, the best imagery source for that application? And this person's asking if Landsat 8 data. Wilson, do you want to add anything in here in yeah, a suggestion? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing, one thing to note about our project is right now um, we've been looking um, pretty much, not, not solely, but mostly at inland lakes. Um, so estuaries are a little more complicated. There's a little more going on. Um, so we are looking at those as well. And um, I'm trying to think if we have Maris data available. I think we do, and and coming Ulchi data. Um, so I, I think we will be looking at those down the road. I just looked at the Indian River Lagoon, and it looks like it's um, kind of on one side of the barrier island on the outside of um, the Atlantic coast of Florida, and it looks like it's wide enough that you could get um, some Ulchi scenes in there, or an Ulchi scene with with some you know 900, so 300 meter pixels. Um, I'm not sure if it's a kilometer wide, but it looks like it might be. So um, if not, then uh, Landsat, yeah, hopefully down the road would, would provide that information. Unfortunately, we're not quite there with the Landsat 8 algorithm yet, um, but we're, we're optimistic that we're going to um, get something moving forward. So um, yeah, I would say stay tuned on that, and, um, and hopefully uh, if, it's, if it's too small for Maris and Ulchi, then, then we can do with Landsat. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, it, also, there may be some work that's coming out. It seems uh, Mito is talking, and I think we'll learn more tomorrow about the Landsat, or excuse me, the Sentinel-2 sensor and being able to um, do more with water quality. And we're learning more about that ourselves. So stay tuned. Um, a couple of questions have come in. Um, question nine is one. Uh, and I think there may be one other question here um, on asking some questions about the apps. The, the links to the apps we've provided in the slide set, but I can also duplicate them here in the question and answer after we're done with this question and answer period. We mentioned a few of the monitoring apps that are out there. Hydrocolor is one. Um, the different um, apps that were a part of the, um, the Cyanobacteria Collaborative the Fido app, which is still um, ready, it's just about, to, they're, they're working on another release. Um, it's a little out of date. So we can provide the links to those in this question and answer, but we'd also encourage you, if you don't want to wait for the document to be available online, is to go back through the PDF and follow the links from the slides that are there. Another question came up, and I think it's actually just question eight. Um, and then a related question, sorry to make you jump around, Elizabeth, uh, question eight, but I think it's also question 11 touches on this as well. Um, asking some questions about monitoring chlorophyll and suspended sediments from mobile apps. Um, this is where I would advise you guys to go look at the Hydrocolor app and to read more carefully the um, document, the, the website itself, but also they have the um, articles that they cite in the document because it provides a lot more information there on the actual practical app use of the app, like how far up off the water and, and those sorts of details, but it also provides information about the algorithms that are being used and importantly, the uncertainty estimates um, bounding the um, chlorophyll estimate that you might make, for example. Um, so it's important to understand that um, your phone is, only provides some level of, um, of information that you recognize that there are maybe fairly wide uncertainty boundaries on those, um, unlike perhaps a calibrated optical system. But at the same time, it may still provide important information qualitatively on tracking a harmful algal bloom in your environment. Alrighty, I have one last question for Wilson. I kind of gave you a heads up I was going to ask you this. And then I think we're going to wrap it up for the questions. Any other questions that we didn't get to in the document here, we'll, we'll um, make sure to answer those um, and make those available to you guys, as we've said. Um, so Wilson, we have a really large um, international population. And I was, I'm really interested in the Cyan tool. And I'm excited about it. And I'm thrilled. Um, it's in the US, so it's something that um, is in the area where I work. But I know that a lot of our international office audience may be interested to know how could they apply something like cyan in their environment. And so I was wondering if you could touch on that and give us some ideas here. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to talk relatively slowly so that 
um, Elizabeth can catch up the typing. Um, okay, and if you yeah, could just be a little yeah. louder too, please. Sure. Um, is that okay? Yeah, that's better. Okay, great. Um, so I would say, um, just just to directly answer that question, um, in, in a short, the short answer is we're not going to be um, expanding this beyond the U.S. That's that's our um, current our current extent is just the continental United States, the lower 48 states. Um, however, it we do think that this is an approach that is um, viable for pretty much anywhere around the world since these satellites do cover, um, have global coverage. So um, essentially we'll be making, at the end of this project, I think I mentioned it, but we'll be making um, a lot of the code that we use to develop the application, the mobile app, um, available on GitHub. And we'll also have some code up there for methods of assessing frequency, extent, duration, and magnitude of harmful algal blooms. Um, so those are all things that, that um, different folks around the world can integrate into their own projects um, to, to assess, you know, where and, and how much um, are harmful algal blooms happening in their areas of interest. Um, we're also hoping to put up some code to establish matchups. So that's uh, in situ data with um, satellite overpass. So you can basically, if you need to validate any of the algorithms that we've um, either come up with or, or validated ourselves here in the US, if you want to validate them in your area, you um, might be able to use this code in order to assess when and where these um, these matchups occur. So you can um, see how well those algorithms are performing in your specific area, and and potentially even um, changing certain parameters in in those algorithms so that you can um, make it more um, accurate for for your area. So um, I think you know it. You're welcome to contact me or um, other folks on the project and, and ask us advice if you do hope to um, do this in your own area. But I think that generally, um, given given the availability of the data and um, hopefully the tools that we'll be providing down the road, um, it, it should be something that, that folks can do pretty much anywhere around the world. So pretty exciting. Great. Well, Wilson, thank you so much for providing information to us about the Cyan project. It's a really cool project. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone here for participating in this webinar series. Uh, please feel free to send us email if you have questions. Um, please continue to put questions into the question pod. Um, we'll get to those after the webinar series. Um, this is the last week of the webinar series. We're glad you hung on for the full four weeks. Thanks for your interest and for participating in this webinar series.